everyone today i've got a great show lined up for you today we're going to be talking once again to derek jensen um derek's been on the show a few times he's definitely one of my favorite guests to have on and i will be sure to link the in the cards the uh other um times that he's been on uh because we have fantastic conversations i strongly suggest that you check out uh jarek jensen's work i can't promise that you'll agree with everything the guy says especially since i do have some right-leaning audience but you're going to find that the man is very compelling and is very good at giving logic so as we get started here first we're going to play this viral video um that is the reason that people know who derek is um, I may not play the whole thing because it's like 20 minutes long, but I wanted to kind of get this, you know, in your heads as far as to what the situation was. And this actually took place a while ago. It only became viral on Twitter recently. So here we go. But the problem with Dodge is one of the problems with Dodge needs was that the oracle at Delphi had told him that his job in life was to deface cultural currency. And what that meant is that he was supposed to uh, violate social norms. And so this manifested in him defecating in the theater. Remember I read the thing about how from the beginning anarchism has had this problem? Um, <laughs> that, so he would defecate in the theater because no one's going to tell me where I can and can't defecate. Um, he would... Uh, uh, masturbate in the uh, in the public market, which the whole public sex thing that's pushed by anarchism <laughs> goes all the way back to that as well. Um, and he would violate all social norms. And so here's the problem: is that, or one of the problems, is again the sort of black and white thinking where just because there are some social norms that are oppressive, therefore all social norms must be destroyed, and that leads anarchism to some atrocity-inducing madness. For example, um, there is a long correlation between anarchism and pedophilia and support for pedophilia. The oh. oh, wait, 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 wait. That's a beautiful line. Thank you so much for asking. How about something relevant? I've been talking about rape culture all day, and pedophilia and the support of pedophilia is not rape culture. He's a rape victim. <laughs> and I stand with him. Anybody that's against him because I'm a rape victim by another rape man. Okay? So we're just because I'm big and just because he's big doesn't make us rapists. We're survivors. Okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And okay. So actually, actually, it seems you're acting like this is a spurious connection. So we're going to play Jeopardy. This is, we're going to play queer theory, we're going to play queer theory, pedophilia, Jeopardy. Okay, answer. Uh, commonly called the godfather of queer theory. Who is Foucault? Who is Foucault? Okay, 100 points. Um, Foucault, uh, another way to ask this is who argued, no, I guess the answer would be, argued for the eradication of age of consent laws as in down to infants. Mm -hmm. Who is Foucault? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, uh, the author of the, the, author of the uh, founding document of queer theory. Who is Gail Rubin? Mm -hmm. Who is Gail Rubin? Um, what percentage? No, no, the answer is 50%. Question is the amount in that article that was a defense of pedophilia, specifically quote boy lovers, the men who talk boys. Oh. And since you're not believing me, quote, quote, this is in the founding document of queer theory. Like communists and homosexuals in the nineteen fifties. Boy lovers are so stigmatized that it is difficult to find defenders of their civil liberties, let alone for their erotic orientation. That's in the founding document of queer theory. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using facts. <laughs> a thousand, a thousand apologies. One must never let facts in the way. Oh, and she also compared, by the way, she compared pedophilia, she compared pedophilia to uh, a preference for spicy food. 
Um, the thing is, I have never heard of anyone who has to have years of therapy because they ate hot and sour soup. Okay, so up to 200. Now it is, uh, now it is, now it is pedophilia and queer theory for 300. Uh, that would be author of uh, Macho Sluts. Well, author of Macho Sluts and Public Sex. Pat Califia. Wait, 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 what was it somebody said? Stay relevant. Let's talk about uh, Pat Califia. Why don't you respond? Because I can't respond. Fucking transphobe. Okay, here's something from one of uh, Pat Califia's books. You know, it's really interesting. It's really interesting that when I actually start talking about the relationship between queer theory and anarchism and pedophilia, that uh, it becomes they they really want to shut me up now. Yeah. Um, sure do. Okay. So here's Pat Califia. Pat Califia. Oh, wait, 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 just a second. Just a second. I was accused of homophobia because I'm against pedophilia. Who is it who actually makes the connections between that? Uh, shoes, we're looking for. Okay, here's something by Pat Califia. Pat Califia has written, any child old enough to decide whether or not she or he wants to eat spinach, play with trucks, or wear shoes is old enough to decide whether or not she wants to run around naked in the sun, masturbate, sit in someone's lap, or engage in sexual activity, by which she does not mean play doctor, she means with adults. And she's very clear about that because she also says that uh, pedophiles should be more and not less uh, invested in children's lives. Uh, okay, so we're at 300. 400 is uh, the most famous uh, queer theorist of today. Answer. Judith. Judith. No, it is not Judith Butler. It's who is Ju Judith oh. Butler? <laughs> okay, Judith Butler is the most uh, famous queer theorist of the day. Uh, and I have a serious question for everybody who's hating me uh, in a moment. Um, except I have to spell intergeneration correctly. Up, 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 up. Okay. Um, we see you, all of you supporters yeah. here, who Good. do not care about trans people lives. Every person in our mouth. Okay, okay, okay. Here's a great quote from Judith Butler. Here's a great quote from Judith Butler. Okay, so, so Judith Butler wrote, so I keep adding this qualification. When incest is a, so I keep adding this qualification. When incest is a violation, suggesting I think there may be occasions in which it is not. Why would I talk that way? Well, I do think that there are probably forms of incest that are not necessarily traumatic, and which, or which gain their traumatic character by virtue of the conscience of social stain that they produce. Yeah, that's Judith Butler. That's one of, that's one of the queer heroes. Okay, now, now we have, we have uh, uh, for 500, uh, we have um, the last one in the queer theory and pedophilia. Uh, the answer is queer theorist who has spoken out strongly against pedophilia. Zero. Zero. Who is no one? Who is no one? Not a single one. Because the entire thing is based on transgressing. Yeah, I know. Dear fucking God. Okay, okay, the question is, the question is, okay, the question is, okay, so we have like two minutes left, and
What is he here for? Um, Do you believe in all theories of pedophiles? Oh, of course not. What I'm saying is that queer theory promotes pedophilia. Queer theory itself. And I, I, gave, I gave citations. Sorry about this, folks. For some reason, it is not letting me bring Derek back in. One second. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I can hear you just fine, Derek. Um, I figured uh, what we'll do um, now, I guess, because I realized it's like there's just too much good stuff in here to just completely stop it. I want to give you a moment to comment on just like what's going on at this point. You know, I know it's been a while since this happened. Well, it's it's really pretty funny, and it's uh, is the soccer term or football term uh, own goal. Uh, this was this was very much an own goal on the part of Antifa, because the whole thing happened because uh, I was asked by an environmental, basically an environmental law organization, to come to a tiny talk for thirty five people. And um, I said yes, and I was going to go up and talk to 35 people at their annual meeting or whatever. And um, the anarchists and the trans activists found out. And, of course, anybody who does not run every, every single opinion past the anarchist central committee has to be. <laughs> uh, or, or let's switch it and, and go to the anarchist uh, bishop synod. Um, everybody who doesn't go there has to be, you know, excommunicated and declared to be an apostate. And of course. Um, so um, they told the organization that they would destroy them as an organization if they had me come talk to their 35 people. And so this attorney called me and he said, I'm really sorry. We really like your work, but um, we're going to have to cancel this. And I said, so you do realize the irony of two things. One of them is that you are an attorney who is um arguing against you know free speech in this case he said yes i'm fully aware of that irony and i said so you also realize the irony of you know you're an environmental organization who takes on huge corporations and you're caving to a mob of anarchists and trans activists and if you are going to cave to a mob of anarchists and trans activists, good luck taking on Exxon Mobil. And right. so I'm fully aware of that irony too. But the fact remains, I don't want my organization destroyed. It's, it's not worth the fight for me. And that's right. fine. That's fine. You know, he he and I, I mean, it was an amicable conversation, just you know, it was he was giving in to the mob. But I don't give in to mobs. And so since the or since the event had been planned, um I went ahead and just uh, organized, or I didn't organize it, Lee did the organization, some terrible organizing. Um, I set up an event at the uh, Eugene Public Library. And I then, you know, there, there was a lot of hostility, um, a lot of, um, no, you can't do this, you can't come and speak in our town, because of course they fully believe that everybody should have freedom of expression. Um, which includes only themselves. And um, <laughs> right. so then, you know, I, I wasn't going to give in to bullies, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up and I'm going to do a talk. And they, the, the one good thing is, is friends and allies pack the front three rows. And, right. Uh, so there was a little bit of a barrier between me and, and them. And then there were quite a few of them in the back. And this is all going to have a point in a minute. Um, and then they started setting off stink bombs. They started screaming. They're they're doing sort of soccer flops where if anybody walks within two feet of them, they fall down and act like they've been assaulted. Um, right. It was. Oh, and they have radios in their backpacks that they're turning on. It's just it's just juvenile. Oh. Anyway, so cops are called by the library. The cops show up, and the cops are completely useless in this case, and. Um, they're just standing there and they're, they keep saying they have a right to, to their free speech, free speech expression. And which, which is completely incorrect because they, yes, they do have a right to free speech expression. What that means is 
the, the government can't prevent them from getting the room themselves. It doesn't mean they get to disrupt every event. And I guarantee, had this been a police knitting event, you know, the, the cops would have shut it down. And there's a great line by Thurgood Marshall that the right to speak includes the right to be heard, which means that if someone is speaking, nobody can shout them down such that nobody can hear. And there were some, a couple of women who brought their children to the event and they both left early because they were scared for their children's lives. Um, anyway, so at some point, I wasn't even going to talk about this stuff. I was just going to talk about environmental stuff. And the night before I had this idea, it's like, well, you know, if, if they're as much jerks as I think they're going to be, I want to have this in my pocket. I want to do this queer theory pedophilia thing. Anyway, so the, the, the cops are there and the cops at one point call me out of the room and they say, look, we're going to clear the room because this is just a mess. And uh, so, you know, why don't you just go home? And I said, no, I came here to do a talk and I'm going to do a talk and you can clear the room. That's fine. I'm still doing a talk. You can arrest me. That's fine. I'm still doing a talk. I am not giving in. I'm not giving into them and I'm not giving into you. And they said, well, okay, great. There's nothing we can do. And so they, I went back out there and I finished the talk. And at one point I, they were just pissing me off so much that I, I did the queer theory pedophilia thing. And here's the thing that I think is just so funny about this whole thing is if they would have just not been idiots, 35 attorneys would have heard my talk. And if they would right. have been only slightly idiots, then there would have been about 50 people in the room and about 500 people listening to live stream. But because they were so such such idiots i this thing has gone viral several times and i think this most recent time is like three quarter of a million views it probably has about a million and a half views over the last uh five years just from various times it's gone viral and then gotten kicked off youtube and then and then brought back and that it just cracks up it's a great example of I mean, there are times when I believe that militance is appropriate and times I believe it's not. And this is a great example of nonviolent, nonviolent civil disobedience, nonviolent discipline, because the point of nonviolent discipline is to let the other people make themselves known. And, right. you know, all I did was sit there and give a talk and they look like idiots. Um, and then there's one more thing I want to say, which is the one thing I wish I would have added. And you can tell me if you think that this was a good thing. I didn't add it. The one thing I, I kind of wish I would have added is there there was one person in the crowd, one woman in the crowd, who was one of the most vociferous at yelling. I'm not saying it's the one that you can hear, because I don't remember. But there was one who was especially awful. And I know for a fact that um, 20 years ago, when she was in her early 30s, she was, quote, in a relationship with an underage teen. And wow. I kind of wish I would have said, Hey, Shelly, just curious. You still uh, you still with kids or have you grown up to adults yet? Um, right. But maybe that would have been too personal. I don't maybe that would it's like I I mean it would have brought the thing home that it's like, you know, this is not just queer theory. This is actually there is somebody in the audience who's really mad at me right now, and here she is. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I I, I didn't do it because I didn't think of it till later, but so it's not like I was doing the noble thing, but but had I remembered it, then I would have had a decision as to whether to do the. Well, I don't know which is noble. I don't I don't know what I would have done. Anyway, there there's the backstory. Well, I think that um one of the other kind of quotes in my mind that came up was uh because there's a people ask me about my own beliefs and I there's a series of videos that were put together by a channel called the Left Libertarian and unfortunately I never found who did it originally, but I've shared his work in a lot of places and one of the things he begins it with is. In any free society, you know, any free um, society is brought about by voluntary action, but voluntary action alone does not create a, a free society. And what he he then goes on to the whole left libertarian theory, but it also applies to situations like this, which is that you have the right to speak. If they don't like it, they should go somewhere else. That's supposed to be the the quote unquote anarchist, anti authoritarian way of doing things. And this is definitely not that. And that's what you and I have talked about this before. Is that one of the biggest problems with Antifa, and when I talk to like you know sensible, non-insane anarcho-communists, for example, because Antifa likes to think that that's what they are, is that the worst possible way to convince people 
that they don't need a state and they don't need cops is to go around as roving gangs, brutally attacking anyone who says anything you don't like, even if it's just like, I don't want mask mandates. Like that was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. They lo literally showed up militantly to attack a group of people who are peacefully protesting mask and vaccine mandates. Like, if there's a government overreach question and you're an anarchist and you actually care about that, you would think that would be a time to open a dialogue about the state. No, no, we got to brutally attack these people. And that's when it just, between that and many other things, you know, especially their ignorance about what will happen, you know, like they don't really have a good anti-police plan. Antifa has proven more than once that they are utterly incapable of filling any kind of role. Um, you know, and sensible anarchists are not trying to just eliminate the state and throw a lever. We have to change the values of who we are as people. Go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things. One of them is uh, the sensible anarchist Craig O'Hara has has a great quote about anarchism doesn't mean no laws. It means the society has evolved where you don't need those laws. And there's a I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, and I'm just thinking about. You know, I, I would never, uh, I would never try to disrupt a talk by a queer theorist. I never have. I don't, I don't care. I just wouldn't go. And, um, and I love the line. So, so decades ago, it was back in the nineties, uh, Ward Churchill wrote this essay attacking gerrymanders book in the absence of the sacred. And I asked Jeanette Armstrong what she thought about gerrymanders essay and the essay, I mean, gerryman, I'm, I'm sorry, what she thought about Ward Churchill's essay. And her answer has, has guided my entire adult life, which is if he didn't like it, he should write his own damn book. And right. I love that. And what, one more thing about this is I remember when I was in college, Edward Teller, father of the H bomb came to speak at my university and we were, we, in, in, in one of the classes I was in, were required to go to it. And it was some sort of English and technology or like, I don't know, technology and society class or something. Anyway, the, the, the point is that I only remember one day of that entire year long class. And that was the day after that, after Edward Teller, who was, I mean, he's the model for Dr. Strangelove. And we had a great discussion in class and no, the, the, the instructor, the, the teachers didn't care whether we agreed or disagreed with Edward Teller. What they cared about was whether we were able to back up our case. So I don't like Edward Teller because, tell me why, because such and such and such. I like what he had to say because such and such and such. That's the, that's the point of college. And, and just along these lines, um, I just heard from a friend of mine who teaches at a university who is being called upon by the university to, university to denounce our friendship because he's friends with me, for God's sake. And the argument that the school is using is that him being friends with me makes makes trans students un, feel, feel unsafe on campus. And it's like, if you're unsafe on campus because one of your professors has a friend that you don't like, you not only should not be at university, you should not even be out in public. You should be right someplace where you can actually be secure. Yeah, it's, that's it's well, nuts. well, the, the whole thing about feeling safe has gotten so out of control. Like, I don't, I, you know, I certainly don't understand how these people think they're going to live in an anarchist society because they're not going to be able to, like, dictate to other people what their behavior should be to make them safe. You know, well, and that's what we do dictate to other people their behavior. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but it, but they clearly want to have a situation where they, they really just don't want to have any other authority in the situation. They want to be able to just violently attack anyone they don't agree with. And, you know, for that to be the new rule of law. And I remember once a confrontation between two Antifa cells because someone in one of the Antifa cells accused someone else in, an, in another Antifa cell of sexual harassment. And I just kind of amusingly watched it go down on Twitter because neither of them, of course, is going to call the cops. And I'm like, so what is it you guys are going to do here? Um, you don't have any way to investigate this to see who's really telling the truth. Are you just going to have your mobs go out into the street and decide this? And they they didn't really have good answers <laughs> for how they were going to solve it. You know, it just came down to a popularity contest. Because, 
you know, if, if a woman falsely accuses a man of that, that's a problem. If a man did that, that's also a problem. So it's just, again, it always comes back down to the fact that they don't behave in a way that would ever convince anyone that you would want those people as your neighbors, you know, in an, in an anarchist society. Well, two things. One of them is that, that a line that I've used before is that anarchists, anarchism is supposed to be about showing that there is no need for some sort of larger authority to run your community. But anarchists are pretty much the best argument that can be made <laughs> for how communities are not able to govern themselves. Um, right. That was one thing. And the other thing I want to mention, well, there's a couple of things. One of them is um, I have done critiques of Christianity, you know, the, the sort of patriarchal stuff, the, the, it doesn't matter. The point is that um, I have in my life, right now I've got a decent car and I have for a while, but when I was younger, especially, I drove any number of $1 cars. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And um, they would often stop by the side of the road and decide that they were not going to run any longer. And I can't <laughs> right. tell you how many times the person who stopped by the road to help me was a Christian who was doing this because that's what you're supposed to do. And one of the one of the larger issues we don't really have to go here, but one of the problems is that especially the left has declared not only morality to be bad, but have acknowledged in the sort of postmodern thing of saying there is no morality, but in many cases have said, like with the queer theorists, that we must violate all social norms and we must actively sort of pursue um, pursue violation for the sake of violation. And that's, that's something I think is a huge problem on the left. You know, you said earlier that some of the, the right wing people might disagree with a lot of what I say. And that's very true, which actually I don't care because this is nothing that kills me about the whole cancellation thing is I disagree with a lot of what I've said. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I don't understand the big deal. Um, I mean, some of my books are, they're thought experiments. I run out a thought experiment and I see how it goes. And then, you know, five years later, it's like, well, I don't really like chapter seven. Um, and, and that's okay. And it's okay if, um, you know, if, if you and I disagree on some things. And also, I mean, there are some, some areas where I end up taking what would be called a right-wing perspective. Oh my God, now they're going to he hate me even more, the anarchists. But it's like, <laughs> I don't, we don't really have to get into this, but I believe there are things that people can do that cause them to forfeit the right to live. I have absolutely sure. no problem with Ted Bundy having been executed by the state of Florida. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's that, I, the whole left, right thing is becoming increasingly inco <laughs> incomprehensible to me. You know, there are some positions I take that are, would be considered far left, some that are kind of left, some that are kind of right, some that are far right. It's like, I'm all over the map and I don't, I don't even understand right and left anymore. And I, I don't think I'm alone in feeling that. And that's what, um, I mean, that's actually like what the artwork for my, my show is about. Like I'm holding up the, the decapitated head of the, of the elephant and the donkey, because right. we kind of need to get away from this. I would like right and left to become descriptors. Like I, I recently did a video because, um, somebody made a really funny meme using the political compass and the upper left hand corner was the left. And that was it. And everything else is far right. There was no room for any nuance. Right. You know, it says this is the modern leftist political compass. And like, I've been told frequently that, you know, people who watch my show are only on the far right and all that other nonsense, because their weird view of things is that somehow if you that's why I've, I said when I had Lier on last was like, it's a religion. And I'm not saying it to be hyperbolic. It becomes a religion when there's heresy, when there's blasphemy when there's no nuance there's no political ideological nuance somehow i'm far right despite voting for bernie sanders in 2016 2020 looking for a similar candidate who's hopefully not insane because unfortunately after him there's really nobody to inherit the progressive movement 
<laughs> that I think is not, you know, that anybody that I would vote for or whatever, you know, but the point is somehow I'm far right. That's not even possible. Like, h- how do you be far right? What, what part of the right wing is going to let me push for Medicare for all? Like, no such place exists. You know, um, but they but they want they want total obedience. That's why I say it's like a religion. In a religion, if you violate, say, one of the Ten Commandments, well, now you're violating the whole religion. That's how they want this to work. But they don't want any kind of nuance to this. They want sheer obedience to this stuff. And I that that also makes it incredibly authoritarian. And they and they become authoritarian in a way that it is ironic because they're so desperately fair of fa- afraid of fascists under every rock, under every tree, just again, like the, the religion, it's the, the inquisition, it's the witch hunt there, you know, this person might be a fascist. And then you get to watch people get called fascist for not agreeing about trans. And then you see, even your dogs have their opinion on the issue, <laughs> you know, but anyway, um, you so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep talking for a moment. But anyway, um, so that was what I was getting at was just that, you know, and Vosh was actually recently, he's a well-known leftist YouTuber. He was on the Vanguard and he just kept telling them over and over again because they said they didn't want to support Joe Biden. You know, he's like, well, we have to stop fascism, 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 you know, got to stop the fascism, this fascism, that fascism, this person's a fascist. And it all reminded me of the George Bush like clip from the old zeitgeist movie that was like terrorism, 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 terrorism to believe to be related to, you know, Al Qaeda. It was like literally everything in the name of fighting fascism and fascism is apparently everywhere. Um, are your dogs done? <laughs> um, for a moment, but they're going to start again. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, except that the word I would use is not religion, but cult. Oh, uh, good point. Good point. Cause I accept that. It's, um, you know, I, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and I stopped being a Seventh-day Adventist when I was in high school. Anyway, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, which is, you know, pretty hardcore fundamentalism. And uh, they didn't assault each other over doctrinal differences. They would gossip and badmouth people, but they didn't cancel people. And one of the big issues in the, the Adventist church was whether it was vegetarianism and um, there were, you know, big doctrinal struggles over, over it, but my family ate meat and, you know, we weren't ostracized for it. Um, and I re- even remember a few potlucks where there would be just two tables, one for the meat eaters and one for the vegetarians. It wasn't a big deal. And I'm not saying that all is happy in seventh day Adventist land. I'm just saying that it's extraordinary to me when, a community that says no gods, no masters ends up being more uh, fundamentalist and dogmatic than a fundamentalist Christian church. It's just, it's extraordinary to me. Well, not even extraordinary. Right. I'm used to it by now. So and I agree, the, get... the, the commenter said fascism equals people and things I don't like. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that gets me too, is that, you know, one of the common phrases among anarchists is bash the fash, but uh, Lier has been assaulted three times by anarchists for saying things they don't like, by anarchist males, by the way. And so basically bash the fash, what that turns into in practice is assault anybody who says anything you disagree with. And it's that's just, definitely not how an anarchist society would ever function, <laughs> at least not well, you know, because they all seem to think that they could just appoint themselves to be the guardians of justice. Oh, well, that's... when everybody's trying to do that, well... Your version of justice isn't the same as mine. <laughs> That's something I wanted to, to mention uh, earlier is that, uh, and stop me if I already mentioned this in a previous conversation we had, that I saw this video a few years ago of a guy who had studied, K, his attorney, and he'd studied KKK violence and he's for, for decades. And he said that there are always a certain number of sociopaths in any group and the question of whether those sociopaths act out in some extraordinary way, like, you know, burning down a church or something is, uh, is, is the, the sociopaths always have the impulse, but the question is how much support have they been given in their community? And this is something, so when there is a lot of rhetoric that, oh yeah, we got to go burn down the church. 
then it's more likely to happen than if than, than if the the larger you know in this case kkk community is not supporting that and the interesting thing here is that you have to ask yourself who would be attracted to a movement that says it's okay to assault anybody who disagrees with you and you are supposed to violate all social norms and who would be attracted to a movement like that are frankly sociopaths and i want to be really clear because anarchists are going to completely misinterpret this intentionally i'm not saying all anarchists are sociopaths what i'm saying is that sociopaths would be attracted to a movement that encourages violence against anybody who disagrees with you and that calls for the violation of all social norms i'm saying exactly what i'm saying Right. And we did talk about that. And I do encourage people to go check out our previous uh, conversations. They were very popular. People really enjoyed them. Um, we had two really good ones. And one of them was literally about the left needs to stop lying. And the other one was about, you know, just like in general about your relationship with this. So and I, I didn't mind it, though, because it was good to like, kind of give a background to where we were at. But that new piece of information was relevant because you didn't bring that up before. But we did talk about the cluster B personalities. And that what you're talking about is not unique to left anarchists either. I had a right, you know, right anarchist, the anarcho-capitalist guy who beat up my wife and made her drink his pee. I mean, that's of course that guy doesn't want there to be any police to stop him, right? You know, so but anyway, so getting back to this whole issue of the origins of queer theory, and I also wanted to ask you if you have ever read any Wilhelm Reich, because I stumbled on his book and um, he has one called The Mass Psychology of Fascism, but in that book, he speaks a lot about how apparently fascism is sexual repression and that therefore children need to be sexualized as young as possible to protect them from fascism. Are you familiar with that guy? Unfortunately, I am. And he has a couple quotes on stuff that have nothing to do with pedophilia that are quite good. And... Um, like Foucault has some really good stuff on uh, the Panopticon. You know, it's just because they're horrible through 90% of what they say does not mean that every single thing they say is horrible, which I guess is what we're, the point we're making about cancel culture too, isn't it? Anyway, right. um, Wilhelm Reich had a few good things to say, but he was completely nuts, pro-pedophile, and I'm in some ways kind of embarrassed that I, I used a couple of his quotes in one of my books. Um, cause I didn't know at that point that, the the whole pedophilia thing, but yeah, there, there's, I'm really not the person to interview about this because I don't know the details that a lot of people do, but there are just, there are horror stories from all the, about so many of the sexologists through that time. There's Wilhelm Reich and then there's, um, uh, oh, the famous, the really famous one, um, oh, in the fifties, uh. Oh, God, I can't Kinsey? remember. What? Kinsey? Kinsey, yeah, Kinsey. Good God. Doing things like basically masturbating children, masturbating, sexually <laughs> assaulting children. And, yeah. Um, and then we go well, He forward. had someone else who did that and was giving him the notes. And apparently yeah. they knew what he was doing for like 10 years and protected his identity because he wanted the damn data so bad. Yeah, that was well, pretty messed yeah. up. <laughs> he, quote, wanted the data so bad, end quote. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, what, anyway, so, so there, th that whole history is incredibly sorted and, um, I don't honestly understand why, um, uh, who's the, who's the actor who played Kinsey in the movie? It's like, I don't understand. It was actually Liam name. Neeson. Liam yeah. Neeson. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I, I actually saw the movie and. Oddly enough, they didn't uh, talk about the pedophilia there. Weird. Huh? No. Imagine um, that. Yeah. yeah. So, and then... so that whole history is really, and and th I was just thinking about this this morning that, um, or, you know, before before our conversation, that um, you know, Allen Ginsberg is still a hero of the left, and he wrote just, he, he, I mean, he was an open pedophile, and he wrote that. Uh, this this great slash horrible line. It's a horrible line, but it's like great for research that um, something about, oh, those prepubescent children will get used to 
our lovemaking if all the feminists would stop making it everything sexy sound like rape. That's pretty close right. to that quote. And I found it extraordinary. When I was getting my MFA in 1990, um, Ursula Heggie was one of the teachers there. And she was, you know, she considered herself a feminist and considered herself a, 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 in favor of, of, of women in general, an ally to women. And she brought, um, oh, I'm blanking his name. The, the guy was just talking about Allen Ginsberg. She brought Allen Ginsberg sure. to do a talk and she was over the moon. And it's just, I don't really understand. And it wasn't like any secret. I mean, he, in, in his, that quote about the prepubescent children is actually in his collected writings. This is not like he made an offhand comment somewhere, which would be bad enough. And I don't understand how, well, I kind of do, but I don't understand how, oh, or another great example of this is Judith Butler was confronted by a bunch of parents in Brazil about her support for parent-child incest. And she put out a statement saying, I don't support parent-child incest. I don't know. I don't know why you're even saying this. It's like, does Judith Butler not even read Judith Butler's books? It's right. It's there's this. I was gonna say I don't understand, but I kind of do because there's a great line by R. D. Lang, who by the way was a batterer. Anyway, there's a great line by R. D. Lang about dysfunctional families, which is there are three rules of a dysfunctional family. Rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence of rules A, A1, or A2, which is why right. the queer theorists can't talk about this. But anyway, I'm getting way off, way off topic. No, no, I get it. And but basically what I was going to say was just that it, it, this whole thing, because I'm researching a documentary right now because I'm just so sick of people lying about it, is mostly just that they basically what I've said. And, I, and I've talked to conservative friends of mine about this, like when I was on Good Logic show, was that there seems to be a way that the the alt left, which is what I've come to call the left, that's just absolutely insane. Um how they go about things. And it starts off with like, let's say that they're trying to get critical race theory or queer theory in the schools. Well, it starts off with them insisting nobody supports that and it's not happening. Then as you start to progress the conversation and you provide more and more evidence, then eventually they go, okay, well, some people support that, but they're just a fringe group of people. It's not very many and it's still not happening. And then eventually it progresses to okay, it is happening and it should be happening. Like that, that's the progression. Well, it's a, a great example of that is the, um, the sexual mutilation of children. Um, right. That, uh, oh, how could you possibly say that children are having, you know, any, any having surgical or chemical mutilation? Uh, and then it progressed to there until now it is a, it's a violation of human rights and genocide to not allow surgeons to cut off genitals and to 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 mutilate genitals and to cut off breasts. It's, it's, that's right. It wasn't. It's exactly the, the the pattern you follow. And another thing that that pattern makes me think of is a sort of standard. I, I've seen some really interesting studies of how um, groomers work with children, and I'm talking about capital G groomers. I'm not talking about uh, larger social issues, but it works on the same level, which is they will touch the child, excuse me, they will touch the child and see what the response is. And they'll touch in a safe place, touch the arm. And they've actually done studies of how the, the movements will, how it'll move. And it, it, it will follow similar patterns, like the outside of the arm is very safe. And then they move to the outside of the upper arm. And then you might move to the inside of the upper arm. And then you might move to the shoulder where they where they touch the kid and at every level it's like if the kid doesn't resist we can move to another one and they get them it's not and i'm not blaming the kid for not resisting i'm saying that they just do it step by step and every level they have this deniability of oh no i right. was just oh and what was it that horrible guy at penn state um not the not the the head coach but the the guy who was doing he called himself tickle monster. So he would start it by tickling and then just work from there. And it's, it's right. so my point is, is this, it's the exact same on a physical level often as it is on that social level that you're talking about. 
Well, and as a sports coach, they make us go through certifications to spot this kind of behavior. And that's why I was like, look, I'm not just making this up. Like you have to learn this in order to be allowed to be around children. And it starts with things like if there's another adult talking to your kid about sex, that's not necessarily a, an automatic, but it's definitely a red flag. And like, oh, now you're showing them explicit materials. Well, there's another red flag, you know, and now you're taking your kids to pride and there's nude men walking by them or riding by them on bicycles. Because one of the other ones is being naked around kids is an aspect of it. So that, so first off, uh, that never happens. And when it does happen, it's good. <laughs> And it's actually pretty perverted of you to even mention that right, it could possibly right. happen. And it's fascist of you to say that if it does happen, it's bad. <laughs> right, exactly. That That's how they handle all of it. And then um, it, and it's interesting that you, one of the other things that comes up in that clip of you talking to those kids reminds me of something else that I just dealt with. Is there was a viral clip of this kid at a pride parade and he couldn't have been like more than eight years old, you know, but he's feminized with makeup and all that stuff. And he is twerking extremely sexually and the whole group is just watching him. And it's, you know, it's extremely suggestive. Well, anyway, I went back to look at when, when that clip happened and it was actually like way back in like 2015 and the reactions to it by a lot of the LGBTQ quote unquote activist community was to accuse anyone who didn't like that of pedophilia. Like yeah. I have multiple articles where that's just blatantly what they said. And the funny thing is I'm going to do a separate video about that. I just, um, I was working on it already and I have everything set up. I just did in my sad sound settings right until now. But anyway, um, there were multiple articles from different gay websites that would say that this was just pedophilia. If you dare to pose this. And I think that it, it just comes down to the writing on the wall. And I've made it abundantly clear because there are plenty of gay people who are not on board with that. They're not on board with children being sexualized at all, you know, um, and they also just look at this stuff. I just talked to Lair about this on my show was that the people who are legitimate, sane, homosexual activists who really just wanted to be left alone are going, what the hell are you people doing? Like, you're just systematically undoing everything we achieve, you know? Well, that was a point I made just with one sort of throwaway sentence in the the queer theory pedophilia jeopardy is where they're calling me a homophobe because I am against pedophilia. And I'm like, wait, and I, I only said part of this, but, but the, the whole thing is who makes the correlation between homosexuality and pedophilia. That's people like, and I'm sorry, I'm so bad with, with names, but the, that right wing former Senator from Pennsylvania, uh, Anyway, the, the, he 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 would make it, or Jerry Falwell types would make it, and the other group that makes it is queer theorists who explicitly right. make the connection between it. It's like, you know, normal. Like I actually don't make the correlation. I mean, I know plenty of gays and lesbians who have absolutely no interest in children, and what 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 studies have shown is that um, a lot of sexual predators on children are opportunistic in that they will they will go for either sex if it's if if the child's available right yeah and that's and i think that um one of the big things that is a so problem wait, I want, that i, I want to respond to to something that yeah Keen, yeah go ahead go right ahead he cycles pdx said i agree this the the person said i don't care at this point that etc community was silent for too long. They knew they were covering for them for so for decades. Look at Harvey Milk. And you know, so I didn't know, and I agree with with that whole covering thing. The the sort of larger community in general. This doesn't mean individuals. Again, I know plenty of individuals who are different, but the the larger community. I didn't know until a year ago, maybe two years ago, that Harvey Milk was was going after. I mean. I don't know what the exact term is, but he was, he was, well, he was sexual predator is the term. Um, right. I mean, he's just, he's this hero. And I had hero to that community. I had, I, I who's looked into a lot of this stuff had no clue that he was, and that's horrible. I don't think he should be a hero at all. He's horrible. Right. Well, that's, yeah. 
And most people don't know. That's just it. And it, and unfortunately, this is what I have tried to raise because I made two different videos. One of them calling out this proliferation of people who are advocates for, you know, extremely graphic LGBTQ sexual education to be offered to children younger and younger, who then, after advocating for it within their school district, get arrested for pedophilia. And, that you know, one wise. of them... Go ahead. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, you're I, saying I, surprise, I, surprise. I, right. You know, one of them was, uh, you know, a guy in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and he's literally, there's a viral video of him at a school board meeting chastising Christian and straight parents for not wanting this stuff in their schools. And, you know, you need to understand that these kids are going to find this knowledge one way or the other. And then he just got nailed in a sting because okay. he was trying to meet a, a minor to have sex with them. There's a, great, there's a great line that I stole from Randy Schilt's book and the band played on. Um, that book was about the response to the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, both by the government and by the gay community and how they both, the government, you know, wouldn't say AIDS for a long time. And the, uh, and the gay community was outraged at any hint of like shutting down bathhouses or something, even though, you know, it ends up that those were, you know, death traps in a lot of ways. And um there was a great line in there where someone goes to the san francisco city council or something and says okay give me a number tell me exactly how many men how many people have to die of aids before you'll call this an epidemic is it 100 is it 200 i don't care what the number is give me a number and i love that line and i've used it in a whole bunch of different contexts and let's do the same thing here it's like you give me a number i'll say to the LGBTQIA alphabet group, you give me a number. How many of these people who are advocating for this have to be, turn out to be predators? I don't care. Right. Thousand, 2000, 20, I don't care. 20,000, whatever number, you give me a number. As long as you promise that when I compile that number, you will agree, but you gotta give me a number. Um, and they of course never will. Right. And, th and that's one of the problems with it is that they they just try to downplay it as say, well, those are just specific examples or it's a small number of people. But like you said, there's never going to be enough. Like they, there's never enough. Like in that video alone, I gave like seven different examples. And one of them was a guy who got arrested in Hawaii. And it was a really ironic moment because he had been arguing on Twitter. And he literally said, you're acting like we want to show kids porn or something. Um, and somebody put a clip of him saying that. And then putting it next to the fact that he got arrested for distributing child porn that he was literally making because right. he, as a teacher, was raping a sixth grader, filming it and sending it to other pedophile teachers. You know, his name was Alden Dunock. Anyway, so like it just keeps happening. And then in the second part of it, I had uncovered that Heather Karina, who is a well-known author and award-winning activist for LGBTQ friendly stuff, had written an article just basically saying all of the things that we were talking about. It's about they want to normalize the idea of sex between adults and children, you know, that that it's somehow beneficial to them, that they quote things like, you know, that like, you know, historically teachers of youths, you know, would have sexual relationships with their students and all of that. And that woman's books are finding their way into schools now. Not everybody knows this about her. I've tried to sell the story, not as in sell as in I want money. I told them, look, just credit me. I've tried to give it to Project Veritas. Post Millennial was interested, but they, they, I guess, want some more information or whatever. But the point is, is that this woman's article calling for this is out right now. And she is still teaching sex education. She was a kindergarten teacher. And she you know, gives like educations and training to teachers now on how best to handle sex education with young children. And her perspective is it should just be normal. So before we go any further, I just want to say that the words sex education and kindergarten should not go together. <laughs> right. Well, you're such a fascist. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> I, mean, I actually thought maybe I maybe I just came at the right time because in the late 70s, um, we had sex education in like seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. And it was pretty straightforward. Just so here here is what happens uh here is what one does to attempt to prevent pregnancy if one does have sex um 
and it was uh i thought it was well two things one is i thought it was fine and the other is um I mean, I hate to be too romantic, but I think that there is a certain beauty in uh, people when they are ready, exploring and discovering. <laughs> I I remember just uh, being surprised. Oh, that's how these things work. When <laughs> right, and, right, and it was it was. It was, I mean, that, that, that sort of fumbling around is, is I think part of the, the beauty that we all sort of look back on. And anyway, so the, 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 the point is I was also raised in a pre porn age, you know, there was, there was no internet, much less internet porn. So I, I really had, except for those classes, which were fairly straightforward, I had pretty much no idea what was going on, which I think, which I'm glad for, I, I'm, but I'm, I'm. I'm I'm yearning nostalgic now, so I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> no, and and the thing is, is I wasn't opposed to any of that either. My mother was a very sex positive person. She would answer my questions, you know, in an appropriate manner. And it, I think what the problem is is that they, I guess, this is something I encountered in my local community is that it was one thing. Well, first of all, the Christian right more or less gave up on any ability from them to be allowed to indoctrinate kids in schools that religion would be taken out of schools you know and if they wanted that so badly then they went and formed private schools right and that was kind of the the ceasefire so to speak but what i discovered in my local community that is a small mostly conservative christian town was that the left kind of saw this as their opportunity to go oh well if you're not going to do it we'll do it right and they openly admit when you can get them believing or not realizing who they're talking in front of that they believe that they should lie to parents about it, that they should encourage the kids to lie to their parents about it. You know, and then anybody who's not comfortable with that, well, that's just too bad. We have to do this. You know, these children need to be indoctrinated because their parents are not going to raise them the way we want on this. And that's why it was like, if this was just about, and I promise I'll shut up in just a second. If this was just about them raising their own children, like, fine. Like, if you want your kid to see the book Gender Queer that has graphic depictions of oral sex, and that's what you think kids should have, you go. I'm not on board with that, and I'd be a little suspicious that that's different. They're not satisfied with that. They want your children, and they don't want you to be able to do anything about it. Years and years ago... Um, I interviewed Judith Herman, who wrote the book Trauma and Recovery, and she also wrote the book Father Daughter Incest. And one of the things I asked her was, if you could change one thing to prevent the abuse of children, if you could just put in place one sort of social standard that would stop sexual abuse of children, what would it be? She said, I would tell any child who has any adult say to them, this is our secret. Don't tell any other adults to immediately tell every adult you can. Right. And, um, and okay, so can you just be explicit and relate that to what's happening in in uh, elementary and junior and high schools now? And I'm going to take and a then, moment to let a dog out while you do that. You got it. <laughs> So, yeah, and that that is really it kind of comes back to what I had said earlier was it was about the what are the signs of grooming? And one of them is just that anybody who's trying to suggest that you have some kind of a secret relationship or there's secret information and that you should keep this a secret from your parents. That's generally a sign that they're up to something. And, and mind you, they justify it in the name of the possibility that parents might find out that their child is legitimately gay and then abuse them. And I'm like, well, obviously nobody supports that, but you don't need to indoctrinate other people's children into like in-depth graphic sexuality to somehow protect gay kids from getting beaten by say their, you know, crazy, you know, conservative Christian fathers or something. You know, we have other means of protecting those people, you know, well, and go ahead. Let's just add that what happens these days is, I mean, if, if at one point, a kid would be beaten for being gay for by the 
crazy conservative father. At this point, uh, the kid is put on puberty blockers and then castrated by the crazy <laughs> left-wing parents for being gay. Right. I mean, I, right. I am completely horrified by the fact that we had an entire nation celebrating the public castration of a young boy on television. I'm talking about Jazz Jennings. This is right. just, that's just, that is, I can't believe we are living in this dystopian nightmare where the lefties argue that it is a human right to uh, surgically mutilate young children. And it's just, it's, I, I can't, and then anybody who disagrees with it is called a fascist. It's just extraordinary to me. Right, um, and that's, yeah, and I, I totally so agree with you. Is, the point is, they the, the same people who are arguing that the crazy conservative father would beat the gay child, those same people uh, are in many cases suggesting that uh, surgeries be done on these children. Well, and that's, I think that um, one of the things I said to Lierre the last time I had her on was that I noticed that a lot of the left's social justice activism seems geared in certain ways to not only undo the work of good activists that came before them, um, but also just to really harm the people that are supposed to be protected. And I think if you look at it like this, let's assume there's some evil, like mad scientist supervillain behind the scenes, right? And they don't like gay people and they believe that, you know, they want gay people gone. Wouldn't it be kind of a neat trick to convince queer people to sterilize themselves if you just don't want them to exist? Okay, A, I agree with that. And B, we don't need to... Now we're like really in my wheelhouse because we don't, in my perspective, I don't really believe in conspiracy theories for the most part or the great man theory of history. What I believe is social... That, that, that if you have a social uh, impulse, that oftentimes if you stop one way of that impulse being uh, manifested, it will move to another one. And that one example of that would be um, chattel slavery in the United States, you know, outlawed in part of the country in 1864 and the rest of it in 1865. Um, it didn't take very long for that same impulse to manifest in Jim Crow laws. And so we had one form of, of, um, of homosexual, of, of homophobia being um, manifested in the fifties. And then that sort of gets, gets uh, dealt with some, I just interviewed a couple of, of old school lesbians who formed LGB Alliance a couple days ago. And, um, you know, for them, like the 70s and 80s were were not a bad time. And now they're saying this is the most homophobic time they've lived in, but it's coming from a different way. So my point is that there are these impulses in society. And if you don't, and if if you if you stop one manifestation, it's like what's the what's the term I'm looking for? Um it's like it's like a balloon. Then you know, if you have a mm -hmm. balloon and then you squeeze one part of it, the air moves over to another part. Um, the same thing happens, by the way, uh, I first learned that sort of balloon metaphor from uh, uh, marijuana demand in the 70s that uh, when they when they cut off the when they, with all the paraquat stuff back in back back then, that when they cut off that, it didn't actually change demand for marijuana. What it did, did is it shifted it to Jamaica, shifted it to California shift it to a lot of other places. And it's the same here. When you still have that underlying problem, uh, it's just going to manifest differently. And this is all the left wing uh, woman hating and homophobia is, is, you know, the modern, the modern trans movement. Yeah. And I, and I look, and I noticed that in addition to the fact that, well, you know, when we were talking earlier about the, the associations with fascists and I, I've been pointing out this weird thing going on. We're going to talk about like conspiracy theories or whatever, is that all of a sudden there's these, vague, extremely fascist, nationalist-looking individuals who keep showing up at all of the protests against, um, like, child drag queen stuff and all of that, and they're really, really playing it up that they're Nazis. 
And I'm like, it's interesting that you guys just kind of showed up out of nowhere to protest pedophiles. And then within seconds, what happens online? Well, the left immediately says, you see, you're doing what the Nazis do. You know, you're doing what the Nazis do. And they go, you, you're not pointing out that they, what they were talking about. These were apparently white nationalists who are all mysteriously masked. And for some reason, Antifa's never there to fight them either, which is another reason why it all kind of feels a little weird. Um, you know, but anyway, you know, and getting getting anybody who might oppose pedophilia called a, a, a Nazi. Well, A, I, I agree that it, it is odd. And B, um, you know what else I agree with Nazis on? That uh, we need oxygen to survive. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I agree with them that pedophilia is bad, presuming Nazis actually think that. And I agree with them. We need oxygen to survive. I mean, that doesn't make me a Nazi. It's just it's also. It, it it is the the most base level basic level not basic it's it's the stupidest is the word I'm looking for level of argumentation e even if even if there even if it's not as you seem to be suggesting some sort of uh, you know false flag sort of thing which it may very well be even if even if Nazis actually do show up to oppose pedophilia it'd be like ah God I wish they wouldn't have shown up but that doesn't alter the fact that uh, that has nothing to do with whether pedophilia is in fact bad. I mean, right. I'm not allowed. If, if, if a bunch of Nazis showed up and said, don't put, uh, don't put poison in our water. I'd be like, well, yeah, they shouldn't put poison in the water. I like, I, I wish it wasn't Nazis who were protesting it, but I mean, you see what I'm getting at, right? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Like, it, we're, we're, but that's kind of their whole hope is to, they don't usually say, well, opposing pedophilia makes you a Nazi. But what they try to say is things like, well, you were doing what the Nazis did. Let that sink in. They're on your side. They agree with you a lot. And it's like, okay, um, cool. Um, I imagine most Nazis prefer, you know, not to be hit in the face. I also prefer not to be hit in the face. That's <laughs> like, <right>. you know, <laughs> QED, you're a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And and what we also got to ask ourselves is, why is it that the Nazis are the only ones showing up to protest to call out pedophilia? Yeah. <laughs> where, where have we gone as a society where we need to depend on Nazis to do that? And then what was even funnier was that, as I pointed out, Antifa never shows up when these people are here. Now, they'll show up at the Wii Spa and beat up soccer moms with their cardboard signs who've never been to a protest in their life. They'll beat them up, you know, but at this point, the only people I have ever seen confront this group of mysterious Nazis was the Proud Boys beat the shit out of them for showing up and trying to like hang out with them and go, you're not welcome here. Because ironically, the Proud Boys are actually pro LGB. They have gay members in the Proud Boys. Right. And they also have black people in the Proud Boys. So when these guys walk up with these flyers saying we hate blacks and gays, their proud boys are like, nah, you need to leave. And when they wouldn't, they just attack them. But again, I've never seen any Antifa attack these guys, which is why the whole thing is, and this is happening in Portland, like Antifa capital of the world. Where the hell are they? Um, as you said, uh, going after soccer moms and for and mothers who don't want their little girls to have to undress in front of males in locker rooms. Right, exactly. So... Before we got on today, I, I realized I forgot to ask you, how long can you go? Because I don't, I don't want to put you in an awkward situation if you need to go anywhere. Um, well, I have, I have company, and we're going to go out in the Redwood Forest in a few minutes. Um, so how much longer do you want to go? Uh, just maybe 10 minutes, just to be able to give an opportunity for you to tell everybody about your stuff and Sounds just great. cap off our conversation. So Sounds I know great. you have a YouTube channel, and I watch that, and you have a website, and I'll make sure to put that link in the description. Um, are you, are there any upcoming projects for you? Um, well, it, I, I want to mention one more thing about the whole queer theory stuff, which is, um, I wrote a book on, uh, anarchism, um, that, uh, was really about the battle for the soul of anarchism that's been going on for a couple of thousand years between those who understand the government, um, primarily serve those in power which is something that we understand. I mean, I used to do talks where I would ask people, do you believe government takes better care of corporations or individuals? And everybody was like, they would laugh at the question. It's just silly. Everybody knows they take better care of corporations. I mean, it's a joke. We all understand this and we all have from the right. beginning. 
And so there are the anarchists who have that basic understanding. That's one group of anarchists. And the, the other group of anarchists are those who believe that because governments primarily are by and for those in power, therefore all social norms must be violated. And they've been in anarchism from the beginning as well. And that's the whole queer theory thing. Anyway, I wrote a book about, about, about that exact subject. And there was a chapter in there about queer theory doing doing law much you know 100 pages or 80 pages on the whole queer theory pedophilia stuff just going through in great detail and that book cost me that chapter cost me my relationship with that publisher and i basically got 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 blacklisted um because uh the 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 publisher wrote to me to say that i needed to take out that chapter and in in his note where he said I had to take out the chapter, he said, uh, everything you say in this chapter is true, but it's a, quote, misuse of truth. And then he immediately jumped to comparing it to anti-Semitism and racism. And he didn't make any arguments. He just did the same thing that the lefties do these days, which is, you know, plug his ears. And I, again, he couldn't, I, it was all cited. He couldn't disagree with any of the, and the reason it was longer than the queer theory pedophilia jeopardy is because I knew that he was going to hate it and I had to make the case. So it's just, I'm citing person after person after per queer theorist after queer theorist after queer theorist saying the same sort of stuff. And um, it really is. And, and my point is that that basically the fact that I wouldn't remove that chapter basically cost me my career. And it's, I mean, I, I've had books out since, but they're with much smaller publishers whom, I mean, well, another publisher dumped me over the same issue. Um, but I'm at a publisher now where they haven't. And of course, after any of the lefties hear this interview, they'll go after that publisher too, of course. Um, but the, but it, 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 I just find it really striking that, uh, there's more I want to say here. First off, I found it really striking that you can't, it's the third rail that you know if you if you touch queer theory you die in terms of any sort of critique and there's actually a reason for this and one of the reasons is pretty straightforward that queer theory is based on postmodernism and postmodernism started with a really good question and answers it as stupidly as possible and the really good question is with all these competing stories how do you know what's true? And we all face this every day. And, you know, in basketball, one guy says, I got fouled. The other guy says, no, I didn't foul him. And the referee has to decide by looking what's true. And in a jury, that's what happens. I didn't do it. The prosecuting attorney says he did it. And uh, that's the whole process is to figure out what is true from what happened and or from, from the evidence. And the same is true historically. You know, a, a, a big one that's, you know, people don't talk about it much now, but I mean, should the atomic bombs have been dropped on Japan? There are those who argue it was one of the worst atrocities ever. There are those who argue it actually saved millions of lives because the Japanese would have defended to the last person. And um, and th that's what history is for, is to discuss those. Anyway, they ask that question, how do we know what's real when there are competing narratives? And they answer it as stupidly as possible. And they answer it by saying, there is no such thing as reality and there's only competing narratives, which is just crazy. It is insane. But my point is once you've accepted postmodernism and queer theory is an offshoot of postmodernism, the only way you can win an argument is by silencing the other person because um, you have postmodernism says there are no facts. And if there are no facts, there is no male, there is no female. Um, we can't, we can say, in quotes, pedophilia is bad, but pedophilia is not, in fact, harmful, according to that notion. And, and Judith Herman, or not Judith Herman, uh, absolutely not Judith Herman, Judith Butler says this. She says the harm from parent-child incest comes not from the parent-child incest, but from the shame associated with it, from the stories told about it. Right. Um, and my, my, my point I'm getting at is, Postmodern. It once you give up on facts and on reality existing, then you cannot uh, win an argument except by punching the other person in the face, 
or calling them a fascist or saying, oh, the Nazis agree with them. That's why, that's one of the reasons that the postmodernists and the queer theorists all have to cheat at discourse constantly is because there is no way I've said the same thing five times now. Am I being clear? Do you, do you get what I'm getting at? No, no, you're doing great, bro. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> okay. Well, it's just, it's just, it is inherent. It is functional to postmodernism that they have to cheat at discourse because they cannot, because they have said, we will not use facts. And so what we end up with, really, that's why we end up with a cult because there, it's, it's like animal farm, you know, all, all animals are equal except the pigs are more equal. All stories are equal, except that the only story you can have is queer theory or postmodernism. And that's right. how it ends up a cult. Because, and that's where we come back to what you were saying about it being a religion. When you were saying a religion, the, 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 I, I loved what you said. And the one word you left off is faith-based. That Right. Um, and I'm not a, a, I mean, I am actually a scientist, but I'm not one of those people who believes that science is the end all and be all. That's something that pisses me off is that, there are tremendous critiques to be made of science and reality not existing is not one of them. <laughs> um, you know, I've seen these lefties, these, these postmodernists, the lefties, the SJWs say, I actually saw one say that gravity is dependent. Gravity is a colonial construct. It's like <laughs> gravity, gravity, step on the cliff. And when you get to the bottom, we'll talk. Um, right. It's just, it, it, it it leads to these absurdities and and i understand that postmodernism arose in part as a response to the notion that science can make it so we know everything on the universe and science can there's, there's incredible arrogance in science and it's a response to some of that but it's as stupid as possible response so the same with the same with the queer theory that it's based on the idea that okay some forms of sex it's it's based on the question how did things that are normal become normalized? Great question. How did capitalism become normalized? How did rent become normalized? How did um, how did beating women become normalized? How did you know anything you want? You, 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 how did how did for God's sake how did the designated hitter rule become normalized? That's what I want to know. Anyway, how did these things become normalized? Um, great question. And then their answer again is as stupid as possible, which is. Um, everything normal is bad. And it's, it's, it's just, I mean, even when it has to do with sexuality, the problem is not that heterosexuality is the norm. That's how we reproduce. You know, right. there, there's no, of course, heterosexuality is the norm. The problem is, why would that mean that, that homosexuality should be stigmatized? I mean, it shouldn't. But then the queer theorists go, well, if homosexuality is wrongly stigmatized, then that means that all forms of stigmatization of all forms of sex are wrong. And that means that bestiality is okay. That means that, oh my God, I have to say this. Um, Lear, and I have it. Lear, Lear and I have conversations not infrequently about what will the, the queer theorists try to normalize next. And you know they've, they've, they've already pretty much normalized pedophilia and they're gonna keep doing it. And they're going after bestiality, and that's happening. This is not, you know, right wing conspiracy stuff. This is not. Oh, this is not the Nazis saying this. Um, so they're going after that. And then there's a new one that I've read two articles in the last week that were two of the most evil articles. That's you. You and I should do a topic. You should. You and I should do a discussion sometime on evil. That's an. Let's do it. Anyway, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think these articles were were objectively evil. One of them was how they were complaining that uh, women, women who take testosterone and continue to take testosterone when they are pregnant should not be, they didn't use the word stigmatized, but should not be stigmatized because, okay, the problem, there, there are many problems with women taking testosterone. One of the problems with women taking testosterone when pregnant is that it can cause birth defects. And they said the only reason that we're stigmatizing these women who are taking testosterone when they're pregnant is because we overvalue, quote, normal, end quote, children. 
so they are they are they are saying that there should be nothing oh. wrong with intentionally taking drugs that can cause now i want to be really clear that there is nothing wrong with a human being whose mother nothing wrong emotionally morally any other way with a with a with a child who's now an adult whose mother took thalidomide and and ended up with with flipper arms it was that. terrible yeah i know what you mean there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong that is not a moral failure on the child's part and it's not a moral failure on the mother's part because she didn't know but that doesn't alter the fact that it is evil to suggest that someone intentionally ingest materials that could lead to a child having birth defects for i know a woman in my 30s who became pregnant and then about two-thirds of the way through the pregnancy she discovered she had brain cancer and she oh, faced man. a terrible terrible dilemma which was does she take the chemotherapy which could uh cause terrible harm to the child or does she put it off and hope that it doesn't kill her and she right. chose she chose to have to not take it and the cancer won the cancer the, the child was born and then she's she died soon after and one could make an argument for whether she should or should not but that's not a question of identity it's not a question of being upset because they're going to not have facial hair for a little while anyway so that was one of the articles and the other article was there are endocrine disruptors all over the planet um they've been oh, right yeah you shared that one with me go ahead well no i haven't shared this one because oh yeah i did i just sent it to you privately um yes yeah so there are endocrine disruptors all over the planet and uh they are causing birth defects and other problems among non-human animals and this includes these non-human animals sometimes being incapable of reproduction right and this article was arguing that uh basically the reason that this that we care about this is because of homophobia because we're scared that the right non-humans are not going it's like i'm sorry first off wildlife is being hammered all over the world for yes. for many many reasons and to threaten and then she, she actually the, the author of the article actually said um that there is a quote perverse joy or glee which was it joy i think that, that we should feel a perverse joy at the uh the the the, the birth defects uh, uh of these non-human animals and that sort of sadism and nature hatred is uh is evil and and right. that's a terrible note to end on so ask me something i can say nicely <laughs> uh something you could say nicely um yeah. well that that's a that's a good one with how with how rough the world is right now uh, um <laughs> uh well yeah we're talking about the apocalypse so we have to end on a happy note right oh yeah well hey you're I, i'm jealous you're gonna go walk in the redwood forest i, I used to love hiking and um my body you know because i have spinal damage I, I don't really get out of bed much but um you know do me a favor and um you know take a selfie for me or something and send it to the to our facebook where we talk and you okay know, you guys having fun out there and um i want to thank everybody for tuning in today i want to thank you again derek for being on and again i've had two other really fantastic conversations with Derek and one conversation with actually like three other old school leftists going like, you know, what the hell is wrong with the current left? Um, you guys can check all those out on my channel. If you came here because you've never heard of me and because you're here for Derek, you know, make sure you also check out my stuff. Um, I can't agree with everything. Or I say, I can't expect you to agree with everything. Um, I'm trying to cultivate kind of an audience that is diverse in their beliefs so as a consequence you're going to hear right-leaning stuff you're going to hear left-leaning stuff but i'm trying to create a circumstance where those people can talk to each other again and that's what we do on my discord that's what we do um it's why my a lot of my stuff is like this so you know i hope that you'll give us a chance and you know derek i'd love to do another talk with you i've heard you've got a podcast you should have me on sometime i'd love to come talk to you okay let's do that
Um, let's let's uh, let's talk back channel and we'll figure out what we're going to talk about. You got it. And it was All a right, great, so great interview. Thanks for the thanks for the conversation. You got it, Derek. And um and everybody again, I'm going to put the description. I didn't do it before we got on here because I was in a hurry. Um, but I'm going to put his website and I'm going to put he has a YouTube channel where he uploads really thoughtful videos on a regular basis. You guys should check that out too. So thanks everybody for tuning in today. I'm going to talk to you extremely briefly when we get off the air here, Derek. And um. I will have some more content today. I also just released a video about Neil deGrasse Tyson losing his mind and abandoning science for feelings. Um, you guys can check that out on the channel. It'll be the video that I just did right before this one. Um, I will have some more content coming up here pretty soon. I had to reset the settings on my microphone so that I sounded better. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, again, thanks again for tuning in. If you guys can support me on Patreon, subscribe, star, and PayPal. Ironically, the time that I said I didn't need support anymore, literally I got laid off from the little job that I have. Like literally the guy called me two hours after I said that on my stream. So if you like what we're doing, you know, and if you can't afford to support me, just just share the links, guys. Like get me out there because as people, many, many people tell me all the time, I've had Brett Weinstein on. I've had, you know, huge guests who have millions of subscribers in some cases and my subscribers count, count stays down because I, you know, the algorithm doesn't like people to tell the truth. So Thanks again, everybody. Take care.